Watch out, it's a live mic. This is Mark McNeese in New York City, and you're listening to another edition of the Live Mic Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. This is Mark on a dark New York City evening. Darker than it was a week ago because the clocks change. So now when most folks are getting off at 5 o'clock, the sun is long gone. I'm sitting at my computer tonight doing another podcast, and I'm very happy to have on my guest. It's Chris McClellan. He's affectionately known as the bow tie guy in many caregiving circles. Faced with his partner's diagnosis of esophageal cancer in 2011, Chris started a caregiving blog entitled The Purple Jacket, and he's an ardent advocate for caregivers and their carees, a word I'm going to ask you about when we're talking. Chris and his deceased partner, Bernard Richard Schiffer's caregiving story in Sickness and in Health, A Couple's Final Journey, which was written by Diane Laid, photography by Carlene Jean, was published by the South Florida Sun Sentinel in April 2014, went on to be seen worldwide by over 400,000 people and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great, Mark. It's nice to, to be here with you. Very nice. We've been um, Facebook friends for a while. Yes. And uh, I was I was glad to get you on the podcast. I know that you did you did a podcast at one point, and you're going to be doing another one, which I'll ask you about. But uh, I wanted to start out with your book. You just published this, or, or it just came out. It's it's called "What's the Deal with Caregiving," and it's um, it's about being a caregiver. Can you just tell us about the book? And it's, I'm interested in knowing. Well, I know what the inspiration was. You lived the experience, but lived just the experience, a, a, about yes. the process of getting this book out. Well, the, the book is really an extension of my, um, or not my, our caregiving experience with my partner, Richard Schiffer, who, who passed away in March of 2014. Uh, I started blogging about caregiving and especially being an LGBT caregiver in uh, 2011, and as I found, as both of us found through the, the blogging experience and our caregiving uh, journey, that caregiving really had no orientation or gender boundaries. We all, this vast network of caregivers, which is estimated out to be about 43 million in the United States, we, you know, what we, what we learned through our process is we all just kind of sit back and care for the ones that we love. And that, uh, that's what was so awesome about being a part of this large network of family caregivers, both uh, both in our community and in the straight community as well. I wish that I had uh, had a book like this about 22 years ago. Um, I had a partner, Jim, who who died from AIDS, and I didn't I didn't reach out. I didn't seek out any resources. I was a caregiver sort of intensively for two years, which is how long it took him to really lose his um, struggle. But I didn't I didn't have any groups. I didn't reach out to anybody. And um, it can get very lonely. The caregiving is, uh, it can be a lonely experience. And I know for, for me, especially after the, the six, last six months of Richard's life and then the, the past year leading up to this, this book, I found myself that I uh, that I, I really isolated myself from family and friends, and and that's that's a common trait in caregiving. We're, we're so intent on caring for the one that we uh, that we love, that we care for, that uh, we kind of lose ourselves in that. We isolate, so uh, you know it it is a challenge to step outside your own comfort zone. But uh, I, as I write in the book, I. I there's no greater honor than to be entrusted with the care of another human being, especially at the time when life transitions. Well, what inspired you to write about it? Um, you know, and it could sort of put it out there for people. Well, I, I, a couple of things, uh, Mark. I, I We were fortunate enough to have this wonderful story that was written about us uh, in the Sun Sentinel that, uh, that far reached our imagination. And, and as you mentioned it earlier in the bio, in Sickness and Health, A Couple's Final Journey. Uh, nobody, nobody knew who was involved in the story that it was going to go like it did. But what I've learned from that process is that story was written about us. 
And I felt like I really needed to write something on my own because I had been blogging for, for three years. I had somewhat of a following on my blog. In fact, Richard, who stood a foot shorter than me, we had a we had a little acronym for him, TLO, the little one. So we would I would get comments from pretty much all parts of the world of how's TLO doing. So this book is kind of a it's kind of an outtake from the blog and and the um, and the article that was in the Sun Sentinel. There's a little bit of uh, memoirs in the book. Uh, there's a little bit of how to in the book, but really it was my way of of kind of giving back to all the all the vast number of caregivers out there, and it really has helped me in my grieving process as well. It's writing has really been cathartic. Uh, cathartic experience for me how did they uh find you to do the story how to what was the genesis of that well that, that's that's <laughs> that's a great question mark because i at the time i was working for um sun Surf, so social services and in, in fort lauderdale which is an lgbt social service agency in fact um, it still might be the only lgbt social service agency in in the country and and we were approached by um, Diane from the Sun Sentinel about doing a story on same-sex couples and caregiving. And I had uh, met Diane casually uh, at events throughout the, in the Fort Lauderdale community. She's the, uh, she writes for uh, Sun Sentinel, and she does the, she's their aging specialist. And when she approached, uh, approached us about doing the story, it wasn't. <laughs> it certainly wasn't. Ex- <laughs> the end product wasn't the wasn't the way it was discussed in the in our first conversation, and that's really the genesis of how it all started. And and even even when we started that process, uh, Richard's cancer had not reappeared. So that's kind of when the sh- when the story shifted from um, from just a mere caregiving story to 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 the issues that we faced as a same-sex couple going into going into hospital systems and dealing with dealing with our healthcare systems and the legal systems, uh, that's how the that's really how the story grew, as his illness intensified. Well, speaking of that, um, can you say a little bit about what that experience was? Were you did you have any opposition? Did you run into obstacles as a same-sex couple, or 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 not? Well, there was a, there were a, a, a few instances. Most of our healthcare providers who knew us were fine with that, fine with us. And I I carried what I what we talked about in the story, my little green folder, with our healthcare proxies, power of attorney, all of our legal papers. Uh, you know, they always ha- I always had those at my side in case we encountered a healthcare provider that we were not familiar with. But the when we went to the emergency room for the uh, first time in September of 2013, the two attending physicians walked into the room and they walked right up to Richard. I'm s- sitting right next to Richard on the other side. They started rapid firing questions with, uh, at him and finally I just kind of spoke up and I said uh, excuse me I might be able to help you with uh, some of the issues that are going on here and they both turned to me in unison and they said well who are you and I think a lot of us you know we, we certainly know in our community that uh, when a male and a female walk into pretty much any type of situation, but especially a hospital situation, they're automatically assumed that they're a married couple. Mm-hmm. That's not afforded the, you know, um, gay couples are not afforded that that luxury. Um, right, and I, <clears throat> I think a lot of people didn't understand and still don't understand that we have those kinds of obstacles. One of the reasons that I was... Uh, so supportive of marriage equality for me wasn't really that it validated my relationships. You know, my relationship was already valid, but I wanted those protections. 
you know, I wanted to not worry every time Frank and I went to Mississippi to see my family or we went to Indiana, we went to one of any of these states where suddenly our marriage was not recognized. Um, you know, and it was, it was a big concern for us. It's not now. Um, but you know, I think it's an important thing to say. It is, it, it, it is important. And, uh, you know, while we, um, we, uh, we were solidified in our relationship and our love, you know, unfortunately we, even with marriage equality today, you know, that's not going to stop somebody's personal bigotry. But those documents do help avoid some of the legal ramifications that uh, that Richard and Richard and I went uh, kind of went through, especially at the end. But you know, unfortunately, our, our the ki- society as a whole doesn't really like to talk about death and dying. But I think when you put it in, when you put marriage equality into the context of death and dying, you and you realize that. Um, in every state of the union, your next of kin is your spouse. And until you've been denied the right to, to be with the one that you love at the time life transitions, that's when you really recognize uh, the unfairness of the laws as it relates to, relates to our community. And, mm-hmm. and if we played a, a, a small role in helping this, um, helping, helping this change the viewpoints of society, then I, I know Richard would, Richard would be very happy about that, and, and I, I would be too. Now, the, the word carry, I didn't <laughs> get to that part. What is, where does that come from? Well, the, I, I uh, comes from an experience that I had. With, I, I blog not only on my blog, thepurplejacket.com, which I still blog on today, but I, I joined a uh, community of caregivers on caregiving.com, and it, uh, it is a vast community of caregivers all throughout the world. And a few years, I guess uh, it, was bef- it was before I joined, but I, I noticed that word also, carry. I didn't know where it came from. It, it, the community decided that the word care recipient just didn't seem to fit because some people care for their parents, some people care for their spouse, some some people care for uh, their neighbor, and then on the on with that, I cared for somebody that I loved and was a part of my life. There's many caregivers out there that are what I call uh, caregivers by default. They're not caring for somebody that they love. They're they're caring for a parent that they that they didn't care for, or are there or a spouse. And the community at caregiving.com just kind of came together and they wanted to find a word that fit the person who they were caring for. And that's how this word carry was, uh, was developed. And I, I've kind of latched on to that myself. It, uh, it kind of proves the point because <laughs> you asked about it and, and I'm glad that you did because I, I think it, you know, it reminds me that um, I was fortunate to care for somebody that I loved, but that's not always the case when, when we're in a caregiving role. And I think the word carry helps bridge the gaps. Well, I like it a lot. Now, I want to ask you just a couple more things. <clears throat> I just want to read some of the, the chapter titles to give people an idea of what's in the book. Okay. Um, I mean, they sound really excellent. Um, do you have a PhD in caregiving, the role of an advocate, your team of physicians, power of attorney, the pharmacist, um, how will caregiving change a relationship? Um, it's disease talking. I'd really be interested in that. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in all of it, but because it, what it's doing is it, it's reminding me, I'm, I'm remembering things I have not thought of, of for 22 years. Sure. You know, when... Well- when Jim was starting to be starting to go through dementia and it's just all these, sure. all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to also, I wanted to ask you, um, cause you talk in here too, about toward the end about wh- what happens when it ends. And I think just as a lot of people are not aware that there are support groups, that there are people out there to talk to, I, like I said, I really didn't have any idea. I was, it was such an insulator, insular 
a world to be in when you're caring for another person, especially a, a, a lover. Um, but when it's over, it's the, your identity or my identity. I want to say you, I don't want to say you because I don't want to speak for your experience, but I've seen other people too, like my sister, when my dad passed away and my mother passed away, it becomes your identity. Being a caregiver is who you are. Right. And when that person dies, the carry is gone. Mm -hmm. There's like, it's just this enormous sense of what do I do now? Well, there's, there's two aspects to caregiving that are, that everybody that is similar to everybody, even though our caregiving experiences are different. There's a beginning and an end to caregiving. And in most cases, we're not prepared for either one of those life events. And I, I thought it was important to talk about the end and what I experienced in the process because it, it, it is something that we're all, uh, caregivers, we all go through. And, and you're right, uh, you know, the identity that Richard and I had, you know, was, was so meaningful to me. And then all of a sudden he's not there. And you still have to find yourself in the midst of your grief and, and work through that. And I don't think there's any way to to sugarcoat the reality that caregiving does end. But I think I'm, but I, I, I hope I, I wrote sensitively enough in the, in the book that it's okay to grieve and it's okay to feel the way you feel. And in your time, it does get better. Yes. And I, um, I, I remember um, a, a bereavement group that I went to and the woman, I thought she was really, really helpful, but she told us that grief is not linear. It doesn't have a beginning, middle, and end in the rest of the world. Other people may say, you know, they've been dead for a year. Of, you know, isn't it time to move on? Well, that that's not the truth. It comes and goes. It It's not, it's, you know, it's not linear. And uh, that's just I'm just putting that out there because I found that extremely helpful because I felt like I shouldn't be sad anymore. Well, that is that that is actually I've not thought of it in that way, but you're that is so true. Grief is not linear. And you know, there's we're 18 months past um since Richard has gone and there you know, I will have I will have a bad day. I will have a mad, bad moment. And if I if if it's happening while I'm driving down the road and I need to pull off and have a good cry, you know what? I'm just gonna I just do it because I know it's going to help me. And I it's okay to own your grief. Um, and nobody can tell you that you should be over it uh, because they're not walking in your shoes. And I had a I had a lady tell me who a very good friend. And she's, she has a, a theory that all you need is 30 seconds of grief. And I just kind of I just kind of laughed at her. I mean, I, I understood what she was saying that about getting over it and moving on. But uh, even when you look at the traditional models of grief of three, six, 12 months, that really doesn't apply because everybody's grief is different. It's not linear. But we all have to be aware of it. And yes. I think that's really the I think that's really the key is being aware of our grief. Well, I definitely am going to um, bring this podcast to my cousin's attention. I, I recently saw a cousin I hadn't seen since I was 19. It's been about 30, 30 some odd years, but her wife passed away a little over a year ago. And she continues to have these days that are just sort of very difficult Um but I mean, I, I think this would be a good a good book for her and a good thing to listen to, so that she knows that she's not alone. Well, and that's that's why it's so important for for all of us uh, caregivers, caregivers alike, to be able to share our stories, because if we can just touch one other person, then we know that you know, we know that we're doing a good thing, because it's it's it it is all about sharing stories and helping others. Well, Chris, I um, I know you've done a lot to share your stories, your story and and Richard's, 
can you tell people how they can um, find you online? Well, the easiest way to find me is through my blog, uh, thepurplejacket.com. And on the blog, you'll see the links to our uh, story in sickness and health, uh, a couple's final journey. Also see information about my, my uh, new podcast that will be coming up called Healing, Healing Ties, Creating a Life to Love After Caregiving Ends. Well, there's and, a, and, it, and there is a HealingTies.com. And there is a HealingTies.com that, uh, that's in the process of being redone at, at the moment. And, um, you know, I've t- kind of taken the last two months off of podcasting to focus on the uh, edits of the book. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm raring to go to talk to wonderful people like you on my podcast as well. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to talking to you again. It's just been a delight. And, and um, you know, I, I, I never know what I'm going to, you know, experience when I have a guest on, especially someone I haven't talked to before. And um, this has just been a great connection, and it's brought up a lot of things for me. And, I'm, and I think your book, I mean, I have not had a chance to read it through, but just talking to you and what I have read, I, I don't doubt that it's a superb book. And the testimonials are, are pretty amazing. So everybody, it's called What's the Deal with Caregiving? And it's Chris McClellan, M-A-C-L-E-L-L-A-N. And uh, Chris, thank you so much. This has just been a real treat. Uh, likewise, Mark. And thank you for the great work that you're doing for our LGBT seniors. It's, uh, it's awesome to be on with you tonight. Thank you. That makes me feel good. Have a great night. You too. Take care.